Buenas noches. Gracias a todos por asistir a esta conferencia que hablaré hoy con Ani Palasma en una serie de tres.
learning any language is quite immersed in our mother language. The very essence of learning also in any creative field is embedded, uh, is embedded more in the student's sense of self and his or her image of the world than any information or facts, any education that uh, aims at uh, delivering information on facts is a failed education. The promoters of the world uh, of professional education seem to entirely dismiss this essential mental and existential perspective. This area of learning can appropriately be called personal growth. Education and learning uh, in any creative field has to aim at the student's uh, individual and unique self and not the content of education uh, sorry and uh, the content of education is bound to be more existential than factual related more with experiences and values than information I can already Hear uh, some objections in the audience. Here there are some professionalists uh, in the audience. But I'll continue to explain why I feel this way after having myself taught around the world for 50 years. John Hayden articulates his educational method further when he writes, I never draw for the student or draw over their work, and I never tell them what to do. I try, in fact, to draw them out. In other words, draw out what's inside them and just hit a certain key point whereby they can develop the right in and not pay for By the way, he was one of my closest friends. I shared with John's educational philosophy and I have even used the same word of osmosis to describe my own teaching approach based on an unconscious embodied absorption as the central uh, learning process. In meaningful education, we shape and mold ourselves, our very personality, character and self, instead of primarily accumulating facts or even skills. That's one another point where standard education goes hundred percent wrong. This bond of self takes place predominantly through an unconscious embodied osmosis or to use the Aristotelian notion mimesis. Our mimetic skills have recently been valorized by the invention of the mirror neurons. These specialized neural ingredients make us unknowingly mimic movements, gestures, and behaviors and others in our environment. Even newly born babies mimic facial gestures one hour after uh, their birth. They 
mirror and mimic. And we, uh, the, the entire magic of architecture and, and uh, art, I think, relies on this, our unconscious capacity to mimic through mirror neurons. Through embodied simulation, we unconsciously mimic in a physical events, objects, and qualities. I can personally say sincerely that I learn more from the way my professors walked and occupied space with their bodies than from what they spoke. I learned more. Uh, being with my mentors and breathing the same air than doing what they told me to do. We seem to be especially strongly influenced by the ethical air that we breathe in our youth. I think that's the primary task of architectural education is to exude that ethical air. The essence of learning is the gradual construction of an inner sense of goal, responsibility, ethical stance, and a combined sense of humility and pride. In my view, exact this polar attitude of humility and pride is the most difficult point to learn. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, the purpose of my teaching. Paradoxically, the essence of learning is unlearning or forgetting the learned facts. I once had the opportunity of carrying a dinner conversation with the great, the great, uh, sorry, uh, with the great Spanish sculptor Eduardo Chirida. During the evening, he said to me, in my, by my, my book, I have never had any use for what I have done before. This is a stunning uh, confession of uh, vulnerability from one of the finest artists of last century. Mind you, this guy was also a thinker of the caliber that he collaborated uh, in a book with Martin Heidegger. Gaston Bachelard, another seminar philosopher, also uses exactly the notion unlearning in his stunning and humbling advice on what it takes to write, uh, in his stunning and humbling advice on what it takes to write a single line of verse. Primer Maria Vinke first says that verses arise from experiences. But these experiences have to be forgotten oh. and still it, uh, it is not yet enough to have memories. One must be able to forget them when they are many, and one must have great patience to wait until they come again. For it is not yet the memories themselves, not till they have turned to blood within us, to glance. Gesture 
nameless and no longer to be distinguished from ourselves. Not to them can it happen that in a most rare hour the first uh, word of a verse may arise in the midst and goes forth from them. I do not know of any more magnificent description of what creative moment is and a better, better advice for students. This is by anybody I look at the board. Why should the making of architecture differ fundamentally from writing a verse? In my mind, no. Simply, we humans are complete biological beings and in any creative work we react with our entire existential sense and identity rather than, rather than with our isolated internet. And we think with our bodies and intestines as much as with our brain cells. Wisdom arises from existential experiences, not mere pieces of information. The hierarchical scale, information, knowledge, wisdom, is not always understood in pedagogical practices. Ludwig Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein suggests for work on philosophy, like work in architecture in many respects, is really work on oneself, on one's own conception on how one sees things and what one expects of them. We have to make ourselves and construct our world before we are capable of building places for other people to dwell or contemplate in. The making of an architect starts from making oneself. In educating creative capacities, information has to turn into knowledge, knowledge into existential understanding and understanding into internalized wisdom. And what is wisdom? Isn't wisdom the finest and deepest quality of being human? As T.S. Eliot, one of the great men of St. Louis, writes, Where is the life we lost in him? Where is the wisdom we lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? All the computer freaks. Uh, have this kind of wars. The poet's line, lines make me think of the most severe threat to humanistic and creative education today. The loss of the book. Books. Well, the books of poetry, novels, arts, or the sciences develop fundamental narratives of causality and they open up epic views into the continuum of culture and human life. Regardless of the numerous advantages, digital media break narratives, they break possession and they break logic into fragmented bits of information. 
they also strip away inherent human meaning, intimacy, tact tactility and sensuality of things. It is not information in a book that is of primary value. It is the book itself. The logic of the story and its ethic, causality, that possesses the highest educational value. That cannot be projected on any, any, anywhere else, but the book itself as well. Great novels provide the most profound theater of learning about the logic or illogic, the ecstasies and frustrations of life. Literature permits us to view and experience life and its mysteries and dramas through the minds and hearts of some of the finest and most talented individuals of the human kind. Through art, we can see with the eyes of Piero della Francesca or Ferber. We can feel with the heart of Rilke and Elia. This is the great gift, the great mercy of profound art and poetry. Great architects lend us the sensitivity of their skin to feel, quote, how the world touches us. This is a quotation of uh, uh, Maurice Merle Bondi. How the world touches us. For me, that's the definition of our language. To use a beautiful notion of Maurice Merle Bondi. We can feel the touch of, uh, uh, of the world and culture through the skin of Luis Baragán or Luis Baragán and experience the mysteries as well as truth, truths of existence. Yes. The complexity of the phenomenon of architecture results from its impurity, impure conceptual essence as a field of human endeavor. Architecture is a practical and metaphysical act. It is a utilitarian and poetic, technological and artistic, economic and existential, collective and individual manifestation, all at the same time. I cannot think of a more complex uh, uh, human endeavor or discipline which would have a more, which would have a more complex and essentially more conflicting grounding in the lived reality and human intentionality as architects. We are facing a really impossible task, I would say. Architecture is, is a response to existing demands fears, wishes, and desires, at the same time that it creates its own reality and criteria. It unites the past, present, and future. It is both the end and the means. That's the most absurd aspect of our is that it is, at the same time, the end and the means. No? I deal with such a phenomenon. Besides, in its aspiration towards an ideal, authentic architecture always surpasses all consciously set aims, and consequently, architecture is always a gift. How does one possibly teach such an impossible? 
possible entanglement of requirements and contradictions. The sheer complexity of any architectural task calls for an embodied manner of working and a total introjection. I'm here using a psychoanalytical notion. Introjection is uh, internalizing the world through the mouth, which is the, that is the way our children, after birth, they understand the world through the mouth. Um, in psychoanalytical terminology, that's called introjection. As architects, we have to introject the world. In creative work, the artist and the architect alike are directly engaged with their bodies and existential experiences, rather than focusing on an external and objectified problem. The whole idea that architecture is problem solving is nonsense. There is no problem in architecture. The problem is in human existence. A great musician plays himself rather than an instrument. And a masterful soccer player plays the entity of himself, the other players, and the internalized and embodied theme instead of merely kicking the ball. Quote, the player understands where the goal is in a way which is lived rather than known. The mind does not inhabit the playing field, but the field is inhabited by a knowing body. Unquote. Richard Lund writes when he comments on Merleau-Ponty's views on the skill of playing soccer. It's surprising that this French uh, philosopher uh, has comments on soccer, soccer play. The wise architect works, I believe, through his, her entire personality, instead of manipulating pieces of pre-existing knowledge or work verbal rationalization. An architectural or artistic task is encountered rather than dissolved. In fact, in genuine painting work, knowledge and prior experience has to be forgotten. Joseph Brodsky, the novel uh, poet, I would suggest to you each one read Joseph Kotsky's collected essays in two thick volumes. First one entitled Less Than One and the second one entitled On Grief and Reason. He puts it bluntly, quote, in reality, in art, and I would think science, experience and the accompanying expertise are the maker's first enemies. Aren't we taught to become experts in our things? Here, a, you know, one of the greatest poets says, that's the first enemy you can have, is expertise. And I would say, exactly, yes, the quote is right. Note that here the word experience has a different meaning than in the quote that I gave of reading a bit earlier. In creative work, forgetting is as important as remembering. Unknowing, as important as known. Hazy perceptions, as valuable as focused seeing. This is implicit in the aphorism of Goethe, which I showed from the beginning of my lecture. I want to 
to say already at this point that because of the impossible task to integrate irreconcilable opposites, the essence of architecture is bound to be mediation and reconciliation rather than expression. Not to speak of self-expression. Architecture negotiates between different categories and oppositions. I also wish to argue that architecture is conceivable in its contradictory task only through understanding it as a poetic manifestation. Poetic imagery is capable of overcoming contradictions of logic through its polyvalent, synthetic, unconscious imagery. As Alvarado once wrote, in every case of painting work, one must achieve the simultaneous solution of opposites. Nearly every desired task involves tens, often hundreds, sometimes thousands of different contradictory elements, which are forced into a functional harmony only by a man's will. This harmony cannot be achieved by any other means than those of art. For me, this uh, 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 pronouncement is, is a very profound one. We can deal with architecture only as a poetic, poetic exercise, as an artist's exercise. This, <clears throat> we could speak of a poetic rationality and logic. Never I choose a book. 
Besides, all artistic expression is seed through the human senses, memory and imagination. Quote, all painters and poets are born phenomenologists, unquote, as the Dutch phenomenologist Van der Berg writes. This is, this, this is exactly the this is, this is the dimensional system I'm using or auto model, which uh, creates uh, visual harmony of uh, musical harmony. This is a, a, a study by my mentor, Professor Luxor. Yes, all painters and poets are born phenomenologists. And we can say the same of all other artists as, as well. As the uh, Bangladesh. Zenin Tsekhi, a neurologist, one of the uh, leading neurologists uh, today, has made another interesting proposition. Artists are in some sense neuro neurologists studying the brain with techniques that are unique to them but studying unknowingly the brain and its organization nevertheless. This is a rather surprising suggestion by human scientists that artists would uh, be pioneers in neurological studies. I understand perfectly what you say. This view opens up a bottomless well for architectural inspiration and insight through the study of other art forms. Because of its severe logistical complexities and layers of practical requirements, architecture tends to lose sight of its fundamental existential meaning and to turn into pure rationality or mere aesthetics. An encounter with other art forms uh, certainly reinforces the architect's sensitivity or the artistic essence 
inspired by the painterly world of Turner, Claude Monet, or Mark Crawford, for instance. These inviting and enveloping spaces of color project a radiant vision of space, whereas Pierre Bonnard's paintings of bathing women express a delicate sensuality and artisticity which can surely teach a lesson to architects. I look at this in a painting by Bonnard at least every second, second week. Because I think they are so fantastic, you know, how space becomes an embodied experience. I want to argue that painting and other art forms have surveyed dimensions of human emotion and spirit untouched by art whose art tends to respond to rationalized normality and remain one-dimensional in its existential scope. The work of numerous artists of our time is closely related with essential issues of architecture, such as Robert Swinson, Gordon Mandel Clark, Michael Heiser, Walter de Maria, Norman Chart, Robert Irving, Yanis Kumelis, Wolfgang Leib, Anna Newton, James Durrell, and James Carpenter, just to mention a few of the most obvious cases. These are all artists whose work have inspired architects and will continue to do so. A number of local artists of our time have explicitly acknowledged the importance of the cinematic world in their work, such as Jean Bel, Dalan Chun, Jean Bohas, and Mike Roche. This is what Jean Bel has to say about the interaction of architecture and cinema. Oh. Architecture exists like cinema. In the dimension of time and movement, one receives and reads a building in terms of sequences. To erect a building is to predict and see the effect of contrasts and linkage through which one passes. In the continuous sharp sequence that a building is, the architect works with cuts and edits framing and opening. Well, I'm quoting John Novell here uh, for the reason I'm just pointing out that uh, there is a really close similarity between um, the, the logic of architectural thought and cinema. In its inherent abstractness, music has historically been regarded as the art form which is closest to music. Really closest to architecture. In my view, however, cinema is even closer to architecture than music. Not solely because of its temporal and spatial structure, but fundamentally because both architecture and cinema articulate lived space. These two art, arts create and mediate comprehensive images of life. In the same way that buildings and cities create and preserve images of culture and particular ways of life, cinema projects the cultural archaeology of both the time of its making and the era that it produces. Both forms of art define dimensions and essences of existential space. They both create essence experiential scenes for quite situations. Film directors create pure poetic architecture 
which arises directly from our shared mental images of dwelling and domesticity, as well as the eroticism and anxiety of space. Directors like Tarkovsky and Michelangelo Antonioni have created a moving architectural memory, longing and memory, which assures us that also the art form of architecture is capable of addressing the entire human emotional range, ranging from grief to ecstasy. Jean Vigos, La Talente, Jean Renoir's The Rules of the Game, Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, and many, many other classics of cinema should be made compulsory ingredients of architectural education. Literary lesson in architecture. I turn back to books. As a young man, an aspiring architect, I organize my books in two categories, architecture books and other books. Later on, I realized that all good books are books about architecture in the essential sense that they depict the interaction of individuals with their settings, life histories, institutions, and customs. As well as, as well as with other individuals. And this is exactly the life world in which architecture takes place. Every single book is an architecture. I realized that the essence of architecture is not in buildings as physical objects, but in their roles as, as frames through which the world is seen and as horizons of experiencing and understanding the human condition. Buildings are mental instruments, not simply aestheticized shelters. The essence of architecture is essentially beyond architecture. It's always beyond architecture. Oh. Let us assume a war. What takes place behind the war? The French poet Jean Tardieu asks. But we architects rarely bother to imagine what happens behind the walls we have directed. Yet, imagining life is more important than fantasizing space. As my mentor, Charles taught me 50 years ago. Somewhat later, I became, I came to get another realization. The books which I had categorized as non architecture seemed to reveal more important aspects of the human significance of architecture than the books written specifically about the art of building and architecture. There is an obvious reason for this. Architecture books tend to be with the subject matter as it flows, formalized and usually conventionalized discipline. Whereas poetry, novels and plays are engaged with the very mental ground from which architecture arises. This observation applies to all articles, painting, sculpture, photography, theatre, dance, music, and cinema. They all reveal the essence of artistic aspiration and expression, and they valorize existential condition behind artistic expression. All arts are expressions of the timeless human existential enigma, and this 
gives Egyptian art, for instance, its voice by which it approaches us and has such a powerful impact across the abyss of four and a half millennia. You might go home and take a look at a picture of the Egyptian art. It's fantastic that four and a half millennia disappear because that's well, it speaks directly to me. The best lessons in architecture I have read are the following. Anton Chekhov's correspondence, which etches the essence of human character as well as the tragic and comic aspects of life in the reader's consciousness. He also teaches the supreme virtue of condensation and simplicity in artistic expression. Rainer Maria Rilke's poetry and his novel, the only novel he ever wrote, The Notebooks of Mount Lawrence Britain, as well as his letters, or indeed the nature of poetic sensibility and the osmotic interaction between the outer space of the world and the inner space of the mind. Rilke teaches us the irreplaceable value of solitude and silence as conditions sine qua non for the world. Joseph Brodsky's essays in which he analyzes in minor detail the poems of Robert Frost, Anna Akhmatova, and Osip Mandelstam, for instance, exposing the incredible archaeology of poetic imagery. Read one of these essays by Frost and you understand what a mind of human emotion imagery, a single poem. This of poem is maybe ten lines. He also teaches us how the tragic, vulgar and commonplace are ennobled 